Quinn, thank you very much for coming. Um, so we're here, we are here today to present on From Bot to Robot, How Abilities and Law Change with Physicality. My name is Brittany Posnikoff. I am a researcher from the University of Waterloo. My main focus is using robots to social engineer people, and I mean the physical robots. And we'll kind of touch on this throughout the presentation. Hi, I'm Wendy Knox Everett. I am a hacker lawyer uh, who's especially interested in how law reacts to changes in technology and new advances that affect our society. And I'm Sarah Turp. I'm a data scientist. Uh, my day job is in tracking most of the internet, but my background is artificial intelligence, online vehicles, intelligence systems, and tracking social media and disasters. Um, I'm covering bots. So in this first section, we're gonna talk about the information you need to sort of understand the rest of our talk, some of our base definitions, and what we'll be working with today. So, social bots. You've probably seen these in the news recently, uh, talking about large-scale misinformation campaigns, but a social bot is essentially software that runs autonomously. And they're often online, and when they run on, online, in apps, Slack, wherever, uh, they're usually about on the same level as human users. So they have bios, they have personalities, uh, they're quite often pretending to be human users, and they have stimulus, um, text, other, other users, they have responses. So they've been seen in uh, large-scale misinformation campaigns recently, uh, pretending to be humans, amplifying messagings from trolls and other humans. Oh, it's me again. Botnets. Uh, bot on its own is useful. A thousand bots is an awful lot more powerful. So bots scale really, really well. Uh, we're going to talk about costings later, but a botnet is a group of bots and they're connected by a common control or a common goal. And you can have hundreds or thousands of bots and they're connecting and interacting with thousands or millions of humans. At the moment, the controllers are pretty crude. Uh, they're fairly easy to find, and they, they tend to be a uh, stimulus response. But as natural language generation improves, as pattern and generation improves, I, we expect them to become more sophisticated. And social robots build on this. They are the embodiment of artificial in intelligences. The robot, social robots, what they do is interact with people and groups on a social level. So this is the same as, as software bots, but social robots build on this by including the, uh, techniques and skills such as gaze, body posture, the ability to point, and it sort of enhances the social ability of an AI. And well, social robots is kind of a more clear definition because it's a robot that interacts with people on a social level. The definition for robot is not as clear. If you read many papers on robots, you'll find that uh, every definition in every paper is slightly different, sometimes conflicting, and people generally don't agree on exactly what a robot is. But regardless of your perception, hopefully we answer uh, all of your questions today about what a robot is and how it can affect uh, law when we add that physicality. Great. So I'm going to discuss some law and policy reactions to the software bots and robots that Brittany and Sarah are talking about. And so just a disclaimer first. So I am here not as your lawyer, and I'm very much not your botnets or your robots lawyer either. So in this talk, we're going to explore some ideas about intent, um, who has it, as well as who can exercise it, and agency, who is really speaking sometimes. The law thinks a lot in terms of analogies. Brian Kahlo has noted that in the context of changing technologies, the law almost always considers new technology as simply a different form of something else. We're going to explore a couple distinct areas of the law today that handle questions of intent and agency in various ways. First, starting with criminal law, we know that botnets can be used to commit crimes by their owners. Criminal law requires that there be both a mens rea which is a state of mind to commit a crime, such as recklessly, knowingly, or intentionally, as well as an actus reus, which is a physical act in furtherance of this crime. We require that acti the actus reus because we want to protect against thought crimes in our criminal law system. So we might ask some questions such as, can a software bot programmed to act recklessly or intentionally commit a crime? Would the programmer be responsible? Can only an embodied robot uh, commit the actus reus for a crime? 
we're also going to talk an awful lot about terms of service, especially for social media platforms. These are contracts between you and a social media company, and as such, contract law governs these agreements. Some of the things that we worry about with this are the same as we look at with contract disputes with humans. We worry about whether there's been a breach, was there agreement, was a contract ever reached? Um, but some of them are going to be a little bit different. Can a bot agree to a contract? Can it do so on behalf of its creator, or can it have its own sort of independent acceptance of the terms of service for a social media platform? Can a bot, bot violate the terms of service, or is the owner the one that is violating the, the terms of service? Does a creator's consent carry down? How independent must the bot's thinking be if it is ever going to have its own uh, independent contract acceptance? In addition to contract law, another type of civil law that we're going to discuss today is tort law. This governs legal disputes between two people that do not have an existing agreement already. So if someone's robot injures you, you might be able to recover under negligence. If the robot's owner acted carelessly, for example, but when can we attribute a robot's carelessness to its owner? What if the robot is programmed with a lot of independence? So tort law actually might really be fine with figuring this out because it allows for the handling of kids and of animals as special categories. People can be responsible for them, but we recognize that these categories have independent agency, although not necessarily always sound judgment. And finally, as we're going to dive into manipulation and misinformation, we're going to be talking a lot about the First Amendment. One thing I want to note here is that the First Amendment protects your, or your robot speech, from government speech restrictions. It does not directly govern speech on private sites, such as on social media platforms. So in this next section, we're gonna be talking about what it takes to create or acquire bots or robots. Um, and we're gonna start with Sarah talking about how you can actually get your own uh, bots and botnets. Well, you can do this for free if you want to. Uh, you just set up a whole bunch of accounts. There are lots of how to set up a botnet sites out there. But I spend a lot of my spare time tracking down botnets. And a free botnet is really easy to find because you're setting up accounts, they're related either by time or by your own characteristics. So a better way if you actually want to run a botnet and not be found, which if you're producing human-like bots, is to buy, buy one. And there are plenty of sites out there that will do that. Lots of, like this is one of the Russian sites. Um, for $100, $150, you can get yourself a set of aged bots so these are accounts that are older, 2015 generally, 2014 sometimes, um, have human histories, sometimes they're stolen from humans, and these are valuable. These, these you can use to pretend to be human beings, you can gradually create what look like pseudo communities with them. If you want to get really crude with this, um, a few dollars will buy you, a few dollars per thousand will buy you bots that are much, much easier to find, but you can use them in volume. You can flood networks, you can push out messages before the platforms find you. So, easy to set up, um, easy to run. You can use human microtaskers to help with those, those setups, make them look human for a while, and set up. The basic thing, if you're trying to run a botnet uh, for nefarious purposes, there are good botnets. Uh, there are good bots out there, but if you're one of the bad guys, and you're trying to manipulate human beings without them knowing it, is you don't want to get caught. Um, this is a fairly well-known bot, and it doesn't sleep. We're looking at day to day to day to day, and there isn't a sleep pattern in there. It's just always on. So there are some very, very easy characteristics. Uh, another one is if you're looking for bots, you quite often find things with 5,000 follows because that's a Twitter API limit. That's a page, comes back, use that and the coordination's cross suite. So there's a whole bunch of ways to find them, and when you set up, that's something you need to take into account. And so working on that, when we deal with robots, is a little bit different. Normally, it's a little bit more difficult to get a robot for free, unless you're like me and you social engineer a few companies <laughs> into sending them to you. But what, the thing with robots is that they require hardware, they require sem assembly, and they require training, especially if they are social robots. A lot of effort is put into the training. And usually you either have to pay for these things in time and skill, or lots of money, or both. 
So as you're looking at the robots on the screen here, um, in comparison to the cheap cost of the bots, the robots here are, range from $50 to $20,000. And about half of these robots are worth $10,000 or more. And so as you're looking at them, I often have a lot of people, when I pull out some of my research robots, um, the third one on the top there specifically, they asked if I got it at a simple shop like Best Buy or something, and they asked if it was about $100. And it's interesting, it looks that way because it's about 17,000. So this is an interesting thing about the robots is what they look like doesn't necessarily dictate what they're able to do. And it is these abilities that highly affect how much the uh, robots are worth and how much they cost. And with that, the abilities can be interesting things. Like, are they able to persuade people? And this is a bunch of research I've done, is use these robots to persuade people to do things they might not otherwise do or, might, or get them to say things they might not otherwise say, similar to something that a bot on a social media site could do. But when we add in the physicality, uh, people actually believe that the robots are more of a living being. And so the interesting thing here is that people build really, really strong connections with the robots, and especially the the embodiment of the robots and react to that differently by becoming uh, closer and more interested in what the robot has to say and what it does. Great, so as we think about botnets, uh, we know that these botnets are often used for DDoSing or other activities and the people using uh, these um, are often using them on computers that they do not own or have authority to work with. Uh, so the use of these computers uh, to run their click fraud botnets or to do DDoSing of Minecrafts or so forth does actually violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So this is a federal statute that prohibits accessing a protected computer, which is defined as a computer engaged in interstate commerce, aka anything connected to the internet, so essentially every computer today, without authorization. And without authorization is what has been disputed a lot in court cases in recent years. Uh, the CFAA is a federal statute, but there are several state statutes that are very similar to it. And although it's a criminal statute, it allows a private right of action as well. And this has been fairly problematic um, in the security researcher community because a lot of researchers have received uh, CFAA uh, civil suit threats in response to uh, vulnerability disclosures. In order to file a CFAA civil suit, the company needs to have suffered at least $5,000 worth of damage. Unfortunately, it's a fairly low bar if you're hiring an incident response firm or doing any sort of investigation or applying engineer time to a problem. So private companies can also ban bots on their platforms as a terms of service violation. But so far, just violating the terms of service of a platform has not been held to be accessing a computer without authorization under the CFAA. For example, in the MySpace case, Lori Drew was able to sign up for an account and she lied about her age when she did so. And the court found that even though she violated the terms of service there, this was not a CFAA violation. An embodiment of software into robot bodies changes another area over in civil law. We're back in tort law area now. So product liability is the part of tort law that covers injuries to a person from a product, such as if your toaster catches fire and you burn your thumb or so forth. Um, so there has to be some sort of physical or property harm right now in order to recover under a product liability scheme, which is a strict liability scheme. It means that you do not need to demonstrate negligence anywhere along there, and you can recover from anyone along the supply chain, from the store you bought it from, the manufacturer, or so forth. So right now, if software causes you harm, such as if a botnet crashes your website, or if a software platform on your computer crashes and you lose some business records and so forth, you cannot file a suit under uh, products liability due to a doctrine called the pure economic loss. It means if you suffered a purely intangible loss, you can't sue the creator of the product for sloppy programming. But as we put software into robot bodies, so sloppy programming could start to cause you physical harm. You might be injured if a robot's uh, vision software is not working correctly and it runs over your foot. You might be injured if software in a car fails and it causes a car accident. 
So now you should know what a bot is, what a social robots are, what robots are, and obviously how to create or acquire both of these. So now we're going to start talking about the interaction. What happens when people interact with bots and robots, and how do we actually go through with the law when something goes wrong in these interactions? So the simplest interaction is amplification of a message, usually a human message. Uh, human beings come with a whole bunch of vulnerabilities called cognitive biases. Uh, one of these is if you see a repeated message, you're more likely to believe it, especially if it comes from different places. So this is hacking human attention in term for, for money, usually financial gain, because eyeballs looking on sites is worth ad money, and also for political gain and financial gain by hacking human belief. Uh, the other thing that happens is you can create real-world effects for botnets. Uh, there are several examples now of trolls and botnets combined creating events and amplifying events with human beings from different uh, opposing groups and creating events at the same time, same place. That, that's slightly extreme, but there's a lot of that going on still. And that is scary enough, but then a botnet doesn't have to have a human being in control. You can set these things off and forget about them. Um, the classic of this is people who've, who've lost their passwords to their uh, bot, bot Twitter account. So there are art bots and poetry bots out there that are continuing to generate poetry and talk about art without any human intervention. That's kind of fun. But then if you create a botnet, you're starting to use a data-dependent botnet, uh, especially if you're starting to use any form of machine learning in there. You can have a botnet that isn't under your control anymore, that is doing things that you have no idea where they're going. And next, let's talk about some social robots and what happens when you get them into your workplace. So the example shown here is a paper called Ripple Effects of an Embedded Social Agent. And the interesting thing here is they had this robot called Snackbot, and what it did was deliver snacks to people in an office. And what people would do is put in their order a few days before, then the robot would come, come and deliver the snacks. But based on the order that the robot delivered the snacks in, people started giving it certain personality traits or believed certain things about its social interactions with other people. For example, the robot would visit the one person, the uh, first every time and would spend the most amount of time with them. So the other people in the office started saying, well, the robot's got a crush on them. The robot wants, like the robot's obviously more interested in them than they are, than the robot is interested in me. And so this is interesting because it's a robot. <laughs> it's delivering snacks. It's got a route that it delivers the snacks in. It'll interact with people as long as uh, they are interacting with it. This might have just been a factor of the person that had been receiving the snacks that the robot was spending more time with. They might have just been asking the robot more questions or being more involved. But people are very willing to give the robots um, a lot of autonomy, willing to uh, perceive them as very living beings, and ascribe certain personalities and um, behaviors to them. And this is important when you inter introduce robots into your space, because you have to think about how they're going to impact the people that they're going to be around. Specifically, I don't know if many of you recognize this robot, but last year it did have a pretty spectacular diving performance. What happened was this robot had fallen into a fountain. Uh, so this is a one story where it fell in and people were like, oh, well, the robot committed suicide. Oh, like we feel so bad for the robot. The robot drowned. They had all these sort of human behaviors that they applied to it. And a lot of people kind of felt sorry or kind of laughed. But then uh, a few months later, when this robot started appearing on a bunch of different uh, streets in San Francisco to shoo homeless people out of certain areas, people all of a sudden started getting upset. They started trying to destroy the robot, kick the robot, smear things over the cameras. Um, so the robot couldn't interact in the space and couldn't do what it had been tasked to do. And this, the important factor here is the context. Uh, the robot being placed in a role where it's shooing other humans, where it's you know having authority over space, really changed how people were willing to interact with the robot and kind of welcome the robot into their own lives or how they perceived it. 
So this is something I see happen actually fairly frequently is people don't think about the contextualization or the environment that the robot is in and it doesn't work properly. It doesn't do what they expect. And this is a bit of a problem um, because in this scenario, it ended up being a huge uh, social backlash for the company that instituted the robot. And then this is sort of my focus is the robot social engineering. So I use robots uh, and their ability to persuade and have authority to convince people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. And so part of this is things where um, I will use a Roomba and I will remotely connect in, into it without anybody understanding that I'm connecting into their Roomba. And I will move it around their space. I will move uh, objects using the Roomba, but the interesting thing, I guess I'm calling it a Roomba, but it's a generic term at this point, but the vacuum-like robots, uh, this one has a 1080p HD camera, uh, directional microphones, and a bunch of cool things. Um, so many vulnerabilities uh, in it, and I usually teach my first years uh, basic uh, things in the university on how to hack these robots because they are so simple. Um, but people are using these in their homes. And the thing here is that when you use these robots and people are used to them being in their homes, they zoomorphize them. They treat them like animals. They treat them like the pets, uh, pets like dogs and cats within your home. But then these robots, um, I can use them to case people's homes by using the camera, moving it about the space to see what's inside the home before like breaking in, if that's something I do, but it's not. Um, but it's an important threat to be aware of, and this is something that's coming up. It's taking the issues of bots and making them real and inside your home and able to directly affect you. Great, so we're going to look um, at a proposal that's been put forth about bot speech needing to be labeled on social media platform. So some of you may have noticed that Twitter recently rolled out election labels. So if a Twitter account belongs to someone who's running for election, there'll be a little marker next to it um, indicating essentially the district or the race or so forth that they are running in. And people have said, well, why don't we have this for bots? If it is not a human that's speaking, we should label it as such. And so uh, just to set this aside, this somewhat ignores the problem of there are many accounts where both a person and a robot is speaking, such as an automated customer service and so forth, where a first line of responses may be automated. Um, however, if we look over into um, labeling bot speech on platforms, this would probably be analyzed under a doctrine of the com commercial speech um, under the First Amendment. Here we use intermediate liability to look at it, and it's fairly similar to the sort of compelled speech that we get with the FDA mandated nutrition labels on our food. So the FDA requires companies to print labels on food because they see it as a public good. You want to know how many calories are in the potato chips or so forth that you've bought. And although this is a form of requiring a company to say a certain thing, which is generally something the First Amendment gets very queasy about, we say, well, it is commercial speech. And so it's a somewhat lesser uh, protected type of speech. And we see that we're receiving a public good and we are reasonably achieving that with this means, and it's fairly narrowly scoped, and so we're going to allow that. But election labels, and also some types of bot speech, start straying more into political speech. This is a little bit different under the First Amendment than just putting calorie counts in your food. So here, political speech is generally analyzed under strict scrutiny instead of under intermediate scrutiny. This requires a much closer look. A lot of information has been paid to misinformation on social media platforms. And this gets into a really interesting area of strict scrutiny under the First Amendment. So in New York Times versus Sullivan, the Supreme Court stated that although first or false statements might contribute nothing to the political discourse, they needed the First Amendment protection to allow breathing room for statements that are true. Similarly, the Supreme Court has struck down stolen valor laws as unconstitutional content-based speech restrictions. These are the laws where we uh, essentially allowed action against people who had said they were members of particular military groups, had taken at particular actions as part of the military or so forth. The Supreme Court said, yes, we realize this is dishonorable to veterans in some way, but we do not want to restrict uh, speech because content-based speech restrictions are something that Supreme Court it gets very worried about. Um, similarly, prior restraints, which prevents the publication of something, is nearly always to, found to fail strict scrutiny. So these First Amendment speech protections 
are based on facilitating the listener's discovery of truth and the distribution of knowledge through a robust exchange of ideas. So therefore, we're really suspicious of any of these restrictions on where and how that speech is made, but we do sometimes make some trade-offs. So unlike software botnets speak through social media, a robot could equip itself with really, really loud loudspeakers. It could wheel itself out into the middle of Broadway in Times Square, and it could stand in the middle there and shout about the robot uprising. So the First Amendment would actually allow New York, uh, New York City to require the robot to stand on the sidewalk instead of in the middle of Broadway, and it might allow it to force it to change the type of speaker or the loudspeaker that it's using. This is very similar to a Supreme Court case called Ward versus Rock Against Racism, where the manner of speech restriction was upheld. This was a rock concert that took place, and it, uh, they were essentially required to change out their sound system in order to make it a little bit quieter so that the people living nearby wouldn't be quite so disrupted. The Supreme Court found that the concert was still going on, um, the speech was still getting out, it was just the manner um, in which it was being broadcast was modified. And so another place where embodiment of software into robots changes things is product liability. So product liability law often turns on whether there is a reasonable alternative design for something. And it tries to balance safety with innovation as it's acting as an insurance function in our marketplace. One of the ways it does this is with the optional safety features doctrine. So if a newly available safety feature comes on the market, we might say that the product with this new safety feature and a product without it are actually distinct uh, products, and we would allow the consumer to choose between them. The consumer might know that a particular optional safety feature that costs more money isn't really necessary for how they plan to use the product. Um, it may actually make things a little bit more cumbersome for them to use it and so forth. And so we assume that the educated consumer is going to decide whether it makes sense for them to pay more for the safety feature or not. However, we base this whole concept on the fact that these safety features are sort of embodied um, in physical things and they have to be manufactured and they cost a little bit more every time you create a version of it to go out in the product. Every time you sell a car that has a particular type of airbag, all the materials and the costs and everything have to go into that. And so that is what drives um, our view of it as a, maybe a distinct uh, product category because it will change the price and the price we passed on. But this starts to break down when the safety features are embodied in software. Once the software is developed, it does not necessarily cost anymore to install a version of the software with these safety features into the robot. Um, this is because software is non-rivalrous. We built the software, we went through all the uh, work to develop it, and we can now install it into any uh, robot or computer that we have. And so this economic argument against making optional safety features into distinct uh, product categories starts to break down as software is what's moving into these physical bodies. And so an interesting thing is when we get bots and robots into our environments and we get used to them, people get very emotionally attached. Um, I'm sure there's a few bots that people have uh, noticed, but the interesting thing is what happens when the void of their removal is experienced by people? So removing bots and botnets. We know where the botnets are. There are thousands of them that are being tracked at the moment. And there are three groups of people who can um, start to do something about that. So if you're removing a botnet, uh, it can be the platform it's on, it can be the person operating that botnet, or it can be people with the hijacked accounts removing bots from it. So removing by a host. They have a lot of power to do this, but there are some bad things that come with that. So one is false positives, accidentally removing humans accounts rather than bots. The other one is that if you remove botnets and bots, you're, you're removing some of the ad revenue across the platforms. It, this has an effect on share prices. It did recently to Twitter. So they can, but they have some issues that come with that. Uh, bot removal by operators. If you're operating a botnet, you can remove that. Um, that's a lot of control. That's pretty easy. Um, there's some small downsides, I mean, one is that if you remove something like Slackbot, then the community it's in have some emotional loss from that, they miss it. Uh, you miss parts of conversations. And, shit, what was that? <laughs> uh, getting, getting your own, getting a bot removed. Um, 
So if you have an account that's been hijacked and been, been part of a botnet, it's incredibly valuable because it has an age, it has a history, it has a human history. But it's quite hard to get an account taken down, especially if you don't have control of it anymore. So most people forget, give up on that. Meanwhile, when it comes to robots, they usually get ingrained to sp into spaces very fast. So the story shown here is uh, the robot Pepper uh, and her role in, as a grocery store clerk in a grocery store. Now what happened here is Pepper was originally a clerk that would stand around and direct people to the correct places in a grocery store. And so people could walk up to the robot and say, where's the cheese? Unfortunately, all the robot would say back is in the refrigerator, which hopefully most of us know because it's the best food we have. <laughs> um, you should know where you store your cheese. So the robot wasn't contextualized. It didn't provide enough information to the people that were interacting with the robot. This could have been fixed through um, more training of the robot, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So after Pepper failed at that, they then moved the robot to uh, samples. So giving people samples, so hopefully they buy the product. Robot failed at that again. So then they tried the robot just as a greeter for the store, just to try and add some value. And unfortunately when it ended up happening was the robot would tell a joke and then laugh for an uncomfortably long time. <laughs> that also doesn't work. <laughs> um, but. It was day in and day out that this robot was interacting with employees. So full work day, every day, people would come in, they'd see the robot. They got very used to having Pepper around. But at the end of the contract where the grocery store was trying the robot, they decided to get rid of the robot. And the people who felt it most was the employees. Um, they were actually very sad to see the robot go. They felt like it was a friend and a family member that was no longer a part of their small little community. And this is important to think about because when you start getting these robots in your homes, in your workplaces, or you see them in public spaces, um, these are emotional impacts that people can feel from the loss of a robot. To build on this, there's a couple of really interesting stories uh, that are quite famous in the human-robot interaction field, and they have to do with military exercises. So the first one I want to bring up is a uh, mine detection robot. It's not this one, but it's a robot that had tons and tons of legs. And what would happen is they'd send the robot over a minefield, and as it walked over a mine, a leg would just fly off after triggering the mine. And it would keep on going, and it would happen again, and again, and again, and these legs would be flying off the robot. But the person in charge actually said, we have to stop this exercise. It's inhumane. So this is a thing, is even if the robot is designed to be destroyed, is designed to be harmed, and is doing its job perfectly well, people still get emotionally attached to them, especially if it's protecting them from harm. And they'll see things like the uh, like pain of the robot as something they can't personally stand. So they will stop, uh, stop moments where robots are getting hurt. And then to take this a step further, if the robots are completely destroyed, like say that, so this is actually one of the robots that was completely, uh, dis version of one of the robots that was completely destroyed. Um, but what happened was in one of these military exercises, they picked up all the pieces, they put it in a box, they brought it back to the company and said, can you fix our robot? And they're like, you know it's cheaper if we just get you a new one, right? And they, the people were adamant, we need our robot back. We want this one. And part of that is because when you work with a robot for a really long time or you're used to having it in your space, you start noticing its ticks. What happens when it operates for a long time? So, for example, I have one robot that when its batteries run down, runs down, it sort of limps a little to the right and looks a little drunk. And I know that robot, like I could take the jersey off, I could take all of the uh, information I have showing which robot it is and just like run down the batteries, have four identical robots rock beside each other and I could pick my robot out of it because you get used to it. So this is another thing you have to think about is if uh, a robot that you have in one of your spaces gets destroyed or uh, starts breaking down, it's not often a replacement cost you have to think about, it's a repair cost. It's how much effort and time and money you're gonna keep into keeping the robot operational so you save the emotional harms to the people uh, that would be missing the robot if it was gone. 
And the last example I have here of uh, robot destruction and removal is Sony Ibo funerals. So there are new Sony Ibos that came out in the last few years, but this story is about even older ones, the ones from about 20 years ago. People were very attached to these little like in-home robot dogs, and they would send them into Sony to get repaired. Unfortunately, some of them could not be repaired. So what they would do is um, take the robots, they would actually give them a full Buddhist funeral to thank them for the parts that they would salvage from the unrepairable ones to then repair other robots that would come in in the future. But that's something really interesting to think about is the respect that people were willing to give to robots that were no longer functional. They wouldn't necessarily even turn on, but they'd give it a full Buddhist funeral to thank the robots. And so this is another important thing to think about is how much impact even a robot giving up its uh, organs for organ donating, uh, organ donating can, can impact people. So removing a robot isn't necessarily very easy. Great. So as we've seen, people react very strongly to robots in their presence. And yet, the legal system sees robots only as property. Botnets are seen as intellectual property of whoever created them or currently owns the platform that they're on. And robots are seen as the physical property of the person who purchased them or the person who built them. These robots lack uh, any kind of legal personhood and have no way themselves to interact with a court system. They're very dependent on their owners or operators to speak for them in court. So some lawyers have noticed that corporations, however, do have legal personhood. They can sue, they can be sued. And Essentially, you can create an LLC, direct the LLC um, to take actions as determined by a software platform or so forth, and you now uh, can pull all the humans out of it, and you have an independent LLC that is out there running around that is solely uh, responsible for to take actions as determined by this piece of software. Um, so it's quite possible that this LLC could act on behalf of a robot, and the robot could appear in court um, as the property of its own LLC for which it is solely responsible for. It's a little bit of a legal inception that we have going on, but it's actually kind of a neat legal hack to use corporation as um, a shim to allow robots or uh, botnets to appear in court. We could imagine a botnet that was out there that was programmed in some particular way to notice that when it started getting kicked off of a cloud platform that it would go and file suit on its own to go to try to protest that. Um, we would probably have a small problem there and that it's very hard to uh, integrate with the courts through APIs. Uh, legal tech is a little bit behind. <laughs> this is probably a solvable problem um, and one of the smaller uh, issues in this. Um, but it's kind of an interesting way that we could envision allowing robots um, and software bots to, to essentially achieve legal personhood in the court system. So now for some conclusions and takeaways. Um, hopefully you've learned a few things today, but we want to just highlight a few things that we definitely want you to walk away with. So first one, bots aren't going away. Uh, some social media sites are estimated at about 20% bot, and not all those are bad. So it shifts from detecting whether there are bots in your system to the behavior of those bots and managing that behavior. And choose your robot embodiment carefully. Um, because how people interact with them is usually how they interact with other people, the embodiment that you give a robot will impact that sort of relationship. So think about this as you're designing, as you're buying, and definitely contextualize your robots the best that you can. And so finally, back in the 1800s, the rise of the revolution and railroads growing across the continental US and UK and so forth, people were very concerned that the law would need to change uh, drastically to deal with this rapid industrial growth and the new sorts of injuries that people were suffering. And we got maybe a few more forms of uh, tort actions, res ipsa locator, um, which means like you're injured and so, um, and it was within the sole control of someone, and so therefore obviously they're responsible for your injury and so forth, but we didn't have this drastic rewrite of our common law legal system. And so again, in the 1990s, the internet started coming around um, and Lawrence Lessig and just Judge Easterbrook wrote a pair of articles that they uh, addressed the law of the horse. And it said, hey, you know, those Victorians uh, with the rise of the Industrial Revolution didn't actually really entirely change their legal system to handle railroads replacing horses for a lot of things. 
And look at this, we've got this really crazy new technology coming, it's going to change society, it's the internet. Are we going to need to change our legal system again? Are we going to get into this code is law sort of idea? And now, uh, from 20 years out, we can look back and we can say, well, you know, we didn't really have to change all that much. Our common law legal system, through the use of analogies and building on precedent and so forth, is actually fairly flexible. We're doing pretty good so far. And as the rise of AI and robots comes around, it's quite likely that we will keep a lot of our same legal ideas and just sort of adapt them. And so one takeaway that I wanted um, some of the people here who work with policy and so forth to think about is that as we get awesome new technologies, we should worry a lot less about the, hey, cool new blinky lights, awesome new features and so forth, and focus much more on how these new technologies affect interactions between people and on places where they introduce friction or remove friction in our societal interactions. Great, so hopefully uh, everybody enjoyed our presentation today and we are now open for questions. Um, before we take questions, if possible, I would like to start um, with any females who have questions or non-binary folks first. Um, if anybody would like to start that way, please let me know. I'll give about 10 to 20 seconds. First of all, thank you for that. Uh, Stacy Gray, Future of Privacy Forum. I was wondering if you could speak to the role of gender in anthropomorphizing physical robots. <laughs> That's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of really interesting things on gender and robots. Um, and it's one reason I fight for gender neutral robots the most I can. Because robots uh, that typically express uh, female body types are actually tend to be less trusted by people because of terrible gender roles that we have in our society. So unfortunately, uh, a lot of the results from the experiments on gender and robots are confirming some of the bad things we have in our society. So I think it's really important going forward with uh, robots that we try and take out the genderization and instead put in situations where we have gender neutral robots that are able to do all jobs. Um, specifically, I think if we can flip back to the uh, acquiring uh, slide on the robots here, um, I want to make one specific example. If you see the uh, third robot on the top row, it has biceps. Why does it have biceps? They're not useful at all. It also has a very deep V, it's got shoulder pads, and it's built like a football player. This genderization actually makes it very difficult for a lot of my uh, female participants to actually interact with the robot as much as well, because they feel less comfortable with it in some situations. There's also the case of voice. Um, I don't know who's, who here has been to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, um, but you'll notice the room with Watson. Watson has a male voice, but of course the assistant uh, AI in the room has a female voice. And this is another thing that happens with the genderization of robots and bots as well quite often is um, it just confirms a, a lot of the gender roles, but not for good reason. Um, so this is something that's actively uh, people in HRI are trying to uh, tackle back against is fight for that gender neutra neutrality so everybody can see themselves in robots and be more comfortable working with them. Next question. Um, so uh, thank you all. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I'm interested in the LLC trick. Um, and if we leave robots aside, so no robots in something, if a natural person sets up an LLC that is designed to do something criminal, I assume that the limitation on liability does not protect the... Uh, <laughs> The person? Did, did, did yeah. does not protect the natural That would person. be a piercing the corporate veil sort of thing. I am not a corporate attorney, um, but yes. Uh, there's two very good law review articles that go into this idea. Um, I'm happy to tweet out. I think actually I already did tweet out links as I was writing our Black Hat paper, but I can retweet those particular links 
it's a, a very interesting legal hack, but you're still bound by corporate law. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we've got another question in the back, or? Hi, yeah, I have a quick question on uh, the foreseeability issue, and in, in, so like a negligence law. Do you know if there's any good case law on foreseeability where it's, you know, software that had unintended effects and looking at, you know, whether that should have been, uh, you know, in terms of establishing a duty for the, the programmer? Sure. That would apply uh, to botnets? There actually are not great ones because of that pure economic loss doctrine that I mentioned. Um, we have a lot of tort cases that talk about foreseeability as far as animals, whether they're domesticated, wild animals, children. Um, states vary the ages where they start granting more responsibility to kids. You can be like under five, under 13, and so forth. Um, but because of the pure economic loss doctrine, there really is essentially no tort law in the area of damages caused by software. It is almost entirely restricted to contract disputes. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. This is fascinating, by the way. I'm just itching to dig up my old Isaac Asimov books now at this point. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, it's just a fairly basic question. Uh, you mentioned there's a, a healthy debate going on about the, I guess, the taxonomy of what uh, a robot is and that kind of thing. I'm just curious where the, the social robots like, uh, or bots uh, like Alexa and the Google Assistant fall into there. Do you have to have some sort of kineticism to be called a robot or does that platform kind of fall into that category as well? Um, so that's one of the things that's argued about, um, is the idea of doesn't need to move. Um, and that is definitely in the, uh, robots that don't move are in the minority, very much in the minority, um, as a definition. Most of the definitions will say that they need, uh, sensors to sense the space around them. They need actuators, so things like motors, to be able to act on those senses. They need to be wholly contained in one single embodiment if they're robots, um, and they have to be able to interact with the world around them. So uh, things like Alexa are not considered a robot. That is very much just an AI because it can't actually actuate. It, it, within its own body, cannot make significant movements that you can see. It can, yes. change, it can change lights. But, but, but Brittany, my Alexa can drive my Roomba. So, but it's not singly wholly contained within a, in one embodiment. So it is not a robot that's an AI driving robot. So that's, I was ready for that. Uh, <laughs> because I get these questions all the time. Um, but this is one of the things is that some uh, definitions will say that it does not have to be, uh, it does not have to move, but then that definition will be applied to a robot that doesn't move from here to there, but can move an arm to pick up a water bottle and put it back down. And that is usually actually enough to make people believe that the robot is alive, which is why um, I typically don't spend too much time focusing on the definition of robot, because it's easier just to focus on social robot, because people apply so many weird uh, uh, things to believe the ro uh, robots are alive, to be social robots so quickly. So even throw googly eyes on something, people are like, that's a face. It happens. Um, any other questions? We only have two minutes. Okay, cool. We've got a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much.